Due to technical difficulties, we did not have a recording of this message, so this is a recreation of the message on the letters of John and Jude. When I was planning this sermon series on the smallest books in the Bible, I decided to lump the three letters of John and the letter of Jude together because they all seem to be dealing with the same dangerous problem. The danger was not persecution, but seduction. It was not from outsiders attacking the church. It came from within the church. The trouble with John and Jude, which they seek to combat, did not come from men out to destroy the Christian faith, but from men who thought they were improving it. Jesus had seen this coming. In Matthew 24, he wrote, Many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. When Paul left Ephesus, he warned the elders there, I know he said that there will, will be, after my departure, fierce, fierce wolves come among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking perverse things to draw away from the disciples after them. In his letter to Timothy, Paul had warned, For the time will come when you will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, men will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn from the truth and turn aside to myths. Paul's prediction seems to be coming true in the churches to which John and Jude are ministering. False teachers had arisen in the Christian communities to which John was ministering. They opposed some of the fundamental teachings of the church, including the identity of Jesus Christ and his sacrificial death on the cross. These heretics had now left the church, taking some of the members of the congregation with them. The remaining believers were shaken in their faith, wondering whether they were missing out on the truth. John writes to assure them of their abiding relationship with God and gives them three ways to know it's true. We'll talk about those later. These false teachers were called Gnostics. Gnosis means knowledge, and Gnostics believed that they were saved not by faith in Jesus Christ, but by special knowledge available only to those initiated into their cult. Gnostics taught that the physical world, including one's body, is evil, and only the spirit is good. This often led to immoral behavior, since some Gnostics claimed that what they did with their bodies did not affect their spiritual state. Rejection of the material world also led to a denial that God could take on true human form and a denial that his death paid the penalty for our sins. Some of them taught that Jesus only seemed to have a body. His suffering on the cross was only an act. Others said that Jesus was a normal man that the Spirit came upon during his baptism and left him before he was crucified so that the man who died on the cross was only a human and his death meant nothing. This heresy led John to write, This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not with the water only, but with the water and the blood. The point of that verse is that the Gnostic teachers would have agreed that the divine Christ came by water, that is, at the baptism of Jesus, but they would have denied that he came by blood, that is, by the cross. For they insisted that the divine Christ left the human Jesus before his crucifixion. The point John was making is, Man's salvation is dependent on Jesus the Christ being fully human and fully divine. As it has been said, he became what we are to make us what he is. Gnostic beliefs about the physical and the spiritual worlds being separate led to certain behaviors in those who held them. For one, some took it to, to uh, force, for some people it took the form of forcing the evil body into submission. Fasting and celibacy and rigid control, even deliberate ill treatment of the body. The view that celibacy is better than marriage and that sex is sin go back to the Gnostic influence and belief. John and Jude seem to be addressing a totally different form of Gnosticism, however. One that held that the body did not matter and that therefore you could do anything you want. Since the body was evil, it made no difference what a man did with it. Jude was dealing with this attitude. He opens by saying in Jude verses 3 and 4, Certain men whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. They are godless men who change the grace of our God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ our only sovereign and Lord. They follow their own evil desires. They boast about themselves and flatter others for their own advantage. These men were immoral in life and heretical in belief. They perverted grace. Their position was that the law is dead and they are under grace. The prescriptions of the law may apply to other people, but they no longer apply to them. They can do absolutely what they like, 
Grace is supreme. It can forgive any sin. The more you sin, the better, in fact. The body is of no importance. What matters is the inward heart of man. All things belong to Christ, and therefore all things are acceptable for those who believe in him, and nothing is forbidden. Therefore, they turn the grace of God into an excuse for flagrant immorality. This problem has existed in every Christian generation, and even if they do not openly proclaim it today, there are many still who secretly count upon God's forgiveness and make his grace as an excuse for sin. John was also addressing the same type of person when he condemns as a liar the man who says that he knows God and yet does not keep, his, keep God's commandments. The man who says that he abides in Christ ought to walk as Christ walked, he says. There were clearly Gnostics in these communities who claimed to be spiritual and have knowledge of God, but who lived immoral, sinful lives. Some of these people believed that they were so spiritual that they were above and beyond sin and had reached spiritual perfection. They basically considered themselves gods. It's to them that John refers when he speaks of those who deceive themselves by saying that they have no sin. He says, if we say we have no sin, the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. This Gnostic belief of, of uh, superiority led to a class of spiritual knobs, snobs. Spiritual snobs who felt superior to others and caused, this caused them to break ties in fellowship with those who they felt were inferior inferior people, and, and even almost like animals to them. They detested the other believers. That is why John insists over and over that the true test of Christianity is love for other believers. John demands that he who loves God must love his brother also, and he who says he loves God and at the same time hates his brother is a liar. The Gnostic, to put it bluntly, would have said that the mark of a true religion is contempt for ordinary men, and John insists over and over again that the mark of true religion is love for every man. So John and Jude are dealing with false teachers who denied that Jesus was the Christ, that he died for our sins, and they felt no obligation to live a life according to his commands. So here is the big message in these little books. The three tests for having an authentic relationship with God. Those who do will love like Jesus, live like Jesus, and believe in Jesus. Number one, love like Jesus. Maybe we don't have the problem of Gnostic heresies causing us to feel superior to others, but over and over this past fall, we saw people who chose to end relationships and friendships, at least on Facebook, because others did not possess or agree with their personal political position. To people like that, John writes, dear friends, in 1 John 4, let's love one another, for love comes from God. Whoever loves, everyone who loves, has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loves us, we also ought to love one another. John makes it very clear that one of the tests of being authentic in your relationship and knowing that you're right with God is you love like Jesus. Number two, you live like Jesus. When I was in college, I remember a college suite mate arguing with a person who was trying to convert him, saying that as a believer, he could kill hundreds of people and it wouldn't affect his relationship with God. My suite mate violently disagreed, and I do too. We are called to live like Jesus. You might not abuse God's grace in this way, but I was shocked at how many professing Christians adopted behaviors that were anything but Christ-like like this past electoral season. To us, John writes, not only should we love like Jesus, but we should live like him too. Second John verse 6 says, this is love, that we walk in obedience to his commands. As you have heard from the beginning, his command is that you walk in love. 1 John chapter 1, verse 6 says, If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. 1 John chapter 2, verse 3 to 4 says, We know that we have come to know him if we obey his commands. The man who says, I know him, but he does not do what he commands, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. 1 John chapter 3 says, We know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself as he is pure. You know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins, 
and in him is no sin. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. He who does what is right is righteous, just as Jesus is righteous. So we should live like Jesus. And third, we should believe in Jesus. More than just saying we are Christians, we must trust in the love and sacrifice of Jesus to forgive us from our sins. It's not our own efforts, not our church reputation, not our right thinking or special knowledge. It's Christ and Christ alone. 1 John chapter 1 says, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. 1 John chapter 2, verse 26, and other selections throughout that chapter say, I'm writing these things to you about those who are trying to lead you astray. As you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. Who is the liar? It's the man who denies that Jesus is the Christ. Such a man is the Antichrist. He denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever acknowledges the Son has the Father also. So that see that what you have heard from the beginning remains in you. 1 John chapter 4, verse 1 says, Dear friends, don't believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they're from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. And this is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, but every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist. 1 John 5, verses 11 and 12 says, This is the testimony God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. And 2 John verse 7 says, Many deceivers who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh have gone out into the world. Any such person is the deceiver and the Antichrist. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not take him into your house or welcome him. Believe in Jesus. So the three tests that we have to know that we have an authentic relationship with God are we love like Jesus, live like Jesus, believe in Jesus. This is the big message of these little books and the big challenge that for you and me to take up each and every day. Love like Jesus, live like Jesus, believe in Jesus.